to the Good Shepherd of the At Home Edition. We welcome all of you uh, to worship today. Uh, we know we were supposed to be outside, but due to the recent rise in COVID cases in our area, the session decided to postpone outdoor gathered worship. We're looking at Sunday, July 5th as our new future date, and the session will meet again to confirm on Wednesday, July 1st. We will continue with streaming worship through Facebook Live at 9.30 a.m. and YouTube and the church website at 11 a.m. on Sundays. If you have any questions, please contact the church office. Your tithes and offerings can be, still be mailed to the church, dropped off at the office, paid through your bank or by credit card at the church office. The upper room devotionals have come in and you can pick them up at the office or if it needs to be mailed, please call the office and let them know. Operation Hope Perishable Food and Ziploc Bag Drive. Please help us support Operation Hope, who is currently feeding 150 to 180 families per week and turning away others during these difficult economic times. We are seeking donations of non-perishable goods one gallon size Ziploc bags and or grocery store plastic bags to be collected at the church through June 28th. A box is outside the church office. We are also accepting monetary donations for Operation Hope. Thank you. And right now I'd like uh, Pastor Scott to come up and I have a presentation to make. I'm always surprising him. <laughs> This is for Mr. Kyle Worth, Pastor Scott's son, on Father's Day. This is for him. He has graduated from the University of South Florida and hasn't been able to make it home through all of this. So this is something from the Congregation of Presbyterian Church of the Good Shepherd for Kyle for his graduation. Wonderful. I will get it to him and, and he will say thank you. <laughs> and now we would like to present the youth with a special video and also another special video in tribute to Father's Day.
our call to confession and prayer of confession. Sin destroys our lives. Sin destroys our relationships. Sin destroys our hope. But through faith in the saving death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our lives, our relationships, and our future are no longer enslaved to sin. Let us trust the love of God and confess our sin that we might receive grace and find true freedom. God of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, God of Hagar and Ishmael, who gave us your Son, Jesus Christ the Crucified, send your Holy Spirit to help us confess and truly repent of our sins. We turn against one another. We fail to care for the weak and poor among us. We pay no heed to the cries of the powerless. We seek our own advantage. Your Son emptied himself upon a Roman cross and revealed your eternal, self-giving love. Forgive us, merciful God. Wipe sin from our lives and let us find ourselves holy in Jesus Christ our Savior. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. God who loves us does not abandon or forsake us. Our Savior hears and answers. When we cry out from the wastelands of sin, death cannot bind us, for the risen Christ sets us free. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. This week we have prayers for the following. June C. fell, but is all right. Fred S. will have knee surgery on the 25th of this month. Phyllis K. is at home after a stroke. Cat C. is at home healing her shoulder and going to physical therapy. Clay J. Shirley S.'s grandson for cancer. And Ann B. Uh, on the death of her uncle in Charleston, South Carolina. And for all those out there who uh, need our prayers. We will be praying for them, those people in our hearts and our minds. <clears throat> Let's bow our head in prayer. God of our ancestors, you are the God of our future. You showed mercy to Hagar and Ishmael in the desert, just as you answered Sarah's laughter with Isaac's birth. We pray that you heal the deadly divisions between all peoples of the earth today. We pray that the Church of Jesus Christ will be so filled with the Holy Spirit, so committed to the head of the Church, that we will have Christ's mind among us. May the sword of the Word pierce our hearts and give us compassion for a suffering world. We pray for world leaders and diplomats who seek to make peace among nations. May their success be measured in generations who live free from the fear of war. We pray for the medical professionals committed to healing, especially with our pandemic and also in the areas of poverty or violence. May they be guided and guarded by the Spirit who lifts up the brokenhearted and even raises the dead. We pray for teachers, school staff, and administrators and students, especially those in high-risk communities. May they find strength in you to reach beyond themselves and so embrace the future with the hope that you are holding for them. We pray for your promised kingdom to come, when all wars will cease and there will be no disease, when courageous faith, hope, and love cast out hatred and poverty. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I remember being a young boy and sitting in my bedroom. It was time for bedtime. I was not necessarily ready for such things. I was playing with some toy, uh, examining it closely, when I noticed some movement near my doorway. I looked up and there was a monster, or so my young mind thought. My sister had donned a head covering and wrapped a sheet around her body, all while making some strange noises. <coughs> there was no consideration from me that this was my sister. My little mind was convinced this was a monster. I was in grave danger. I screamed. Or rather, I tried to scream. I couldn't. I was frozen in fear. Fortunately, my sister realized her ruse had gone rather further than she imagined, and she took off her head covering, and I relaxed and regained my voice. Have you ever been frozen in fear? Have you ever had a visceral moment where you could do nothing except to sit or stand there in fear? Today we talk about fear. Not particularly the very moment of shock as in my story, but the more generalized kind. Where you're not shocked into being a statue, but fear where you similarly may lose your ability or your resolve to act in some way. At moments of shock, it is easy to see that fear can freeze us stiff or silence our voice. Despite the obvious need to take flight or to scream or to fight, and it is also true that fear in general, not just times of shock, can also restrict our actions, keep us in the same place, just cause us to just not do what we should do. You see, fear has a way of keeping us in place. Fear can prevent us from taking steps forward as a person and as a people. Fear often eclipses possibility and hope. Fear, you see, is an enemy of living free. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to take up this topic of fear with his disciples. Fear is, is there a more predominant force in our human experience than fear? From the moment we are born, we learn to fear the world around us. Certainly to fear the stranger, to protect them, we teach our young ones catchy phrases like stranger danger. Generally, we develop fear of the unknown, be it people or even new discoveries, or even new ways of doing things. We have a response of fear. Fear is a powerful force. As you know, political leaders have taken note of this powerful force. Politicians running for office, or at least their campaign managers, have long recognized the power of fear. They often use fear in enlisting our conformity to the structures of this world. Even when doing so doesn't serve our best interest. And by remember the Patriot Act of 2001. Fear is the driving force behind vast segments of our economy, as well as, increasingly, our political priorities. Take, for example, gun legislation. Fear seems to dictate our actions on either side of the political spectrum. When a presidential candidate comes uh, on, the, on the scene and threatens to halt or reduce certain arms sales, which is based on the fear of what, say, assault rifles can do in neighborhoods, it sets forth a fear response, which you can almost set your watch to. As that political concern is expressed, 
It is that very moment when sales of those particular guns go through the roof. And for years, that's always really bugged me, but I understand it, but it still bugs me. Once again, fear is lived into. The public thinks that those particular guns will no longer be available, so they need to buy it now. Fear begets fear. So much so that even people who probably would never have bought one of these weapons now does so because they fear they would lose the ability to acquire such a weapon sometime in the near future. The result of this fear dance. Now there are even more of these particular guns in the hands of the public, which then causes greater fear on the other side. And increasing occasions for legislative restrictions, which then drive more widespread buying, and so on, and so on, and so on. Fear-based decision-making can serve to heighten, not diffuse, existing public concerns. Now what I want you to hear in this example is that whether you are pro-gun or anti-gun, the sad thing is, it is fear that seems to be driving much of the decision-making. Fear, if we are honest, often does drive us. Fear can lead us by the nose. And Jesus recognizes that it is fear that can cause the complete failure of discipleship. Now the disciples started out strong. Jesus' disciples courageously leave the security of their homes and their families despite the fear that that may have caused to do such a thing, to follow him as Jesus proclaimed the advent of God's reign. But these disciples too will soon know and feel the grip and the power of fear. In fact, these very disciples in the immediate future will indeed collapse in fear's wake. You see, faithful proclamation and the practice of the gospel inevitably puts disciples on a collision course with the powers of this world. And while well, quite honestly, that is scary. That can cause fear. And what we are addressing today is that fear based secrets and the threat of conflict, even the threat of death, can take up residence in a disciple and derail our ability to live the gospel. Let's spend some time this morning looking at fear-based secrets. How fear can promote an environment of secret keeping which evidently is contrary to the way Jesus calls us to live. Fear. Jesus said, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. The simple long-term view is this, truth is going to see the light of day. Don't let hiding the truth, don't let secrets enslave you. Don't hide the truth by means of secret keeping. Don't do it individually, don't do it corporately. You may say, Pastor, I understand when, when you say hiding the truth individually, I get that. But what is hiding the truth corporately? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> Let me give an unbelievable example in our nation's history. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, in a district called Greenwood in the year 1921, a shocking racially motivated thing happened. It was so shocking, it had at least the chance of waking up a nation. But it was downplayed. It was underreported. 
The facts were buried, as were the bodies. It was made a secret. And it stayed in the shadows for three quarters of a century. Last year, quite incidentally or providentially, I watched a series that had been re released for streaming entitled The Watchmen. The 10 part series came out in 2019. And by the way, I'm not necessarily recommending that you go watch this series, but it is noteworthy how they started out. It starts out its story in Oklahoma. The scenes show the KKK and white men in general descending on a black town, a black town which is quite complete in its offerings of services to the community and movie theaters and grocery stores, doctors and dentist offices. The scene showed white against black looting and burning and destroying and killing in earnest. I watched that opening scene and I thought to myself, well, that is curious. This show is completely science fiction. You know, it's kind of based on comic books. But I wonder why they chose Tulsa, Oklahoma. Fast forward a few months and I hear another reference to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I remembered that opening scene and it occurred to me that there may be something to it. A few clicks in the mouse and it turns out there is. Tulsa, Oklahoma was home to the worst racially motivated mob violence in the early 20th century. But I had never heard about it. I had never heard about it in my schooling years or even since the time of my schooling years. Because the whole event has been largely held under wraps. The tragic event happened over a period of two days back in 1921 in the northern part of Tulsa. This was a time of segregation. There uh, once was a prosperous black district called Greenwood. So prosperous was this black community that one writer dubbed it Black Wall Street. Now Tulsa in general had experienced great growth and prosperity due to the oil fields that were discovered there during the oil boom. And at one point, Tulsa was the largest oil producer in the country. One day in the white part of town, a young black man entered an elevator with a young white woman as the elevator operator. She screamed somewhere in that elevator ride. He fled that elevator and then later that day was arrested. The rumors started flying around. The local paper wrote an inflammatory article. And by the next day, a mob started gathering outside of the government building where they held this boy in question. But word about the lynch mob forming got back to the folks in Greenwood, and black men also assembled to defend one of their own. Some of these gathered were World War I veterans. An assembly there was gathered, and these men went down also to the government building to offer assistance to the sheriff to protect the young prisoner. Well, the sheriff declined their help, but the sheriff was also successful in holding back those who would hurt the young man. Unfortunately, the fervor of the white crowd now directed itself at the adult men who came on the scene. One KKK man confronted one black man trying to take his gun away. The gun went off, and so did the crowd. The KKK-influenced crowd started moving toward Greenwood. Growing in size every step of the way, growing in anger yard by yard, growing in resolve by each other's passion. The white mob went into Greenwood, and they started breaking into stores, started breaking into houses, started smashing things, 
setting fires, started killing innocent people. Inexplicably, over the next 24 hours, planes were even brought in to drop firebombs from the sky to widen the destruction in this black community. Friends, in all, 35 square blocks were destroyed of houses, of businesses. 35 square blocks. That's huge. 8 to 10,000 people lost their homes. An estimated 300 people were killed. It was the worst mob uprising ever seen. They called it a race riot, but it was more like genocide. It was more like how Hitler and the Nazis treated the Jews. And I had never heard about it in my history class. You probably had never heard about it either in your history class because somehow, some way, it became a secret. A corporate secret of a city, of a state, of a nation. The truth was not allowed to come out. Then 60 Minutes did a piece on it in 1999, 78 years later. In that segment, they held a large meeting with people who were living in Greenwood that day. One young man stood up and recounted going away to college and hearing for the first time the story of Black Wall Street and what happened there. This young man said, I have lived in Greenwood my whole life and I never heard of it. Can you imagine keeping such an atrocity a secret? The story of Greenwood in 1921 needed to be confronted in that very day and time. The country needed to know. People needed to be confronted with difficult truth. The story needed to be told, not whispered and quiet, but screamed in loud voices from housetops. It needed to come out, but those in power suppressed it. Those who killed black citizens also killed the story. You know, I can't help but wonder, could the knowledge of such a vile occurrence have changed the arc of the curve of racial injustice that we still wrestle with today. I mean, for many of us, we are just learning about it this week. And it has now been 99 years since it happened. Friends, truth needs to be told. And truth needs to be told in a timely fashion. And the peaceful demonstrations we are experiencing today are pounding that very drum. And we need to listen. And we, the followers of Christ in particular, should not ever be timid to enter any conversation where truth is being brought out into the light of day. We should never put tragedy on hold or brush it under the rug because it is ugly or horrible or incriminating. Hiding the truth we already know can and will enslave you. How often an abusive relationship has hiding the truth caused prolonged anguish for its victims? How long in abusive relationships has it caused prolonged anguish for the victims to hide the truth? Almost every time. How much has not addressing racism or not talking about its reality or ignoring the systemic causes 
contributed, contributed to the actions or the reactions that we are experiencing today across our nation. Don't hide the truth. Don't buy into secrets. Work instead towards speaking the truth because as Jesus says, it is going to come out anyway. Friends, here is the hard reality. It is sometimes a risk to speak the truth. And I would imagine we have all struggled with that fact. Let me ask you, has the fear of rejection ever stopped you from speaking up when you knew right here that you should? You see, fear sometimes shuts us up from speaking up. That's what fear does. But we should take note in our passage today that Jesus invites us to speak up. In our passage today, when it comes to the good news, Jesus says, don't whisper it, proclaim it from the housetop. Don't speak it in the dark, say it in the light. Jesus' mission and discourse is a get-out-the-truth-tellers campaign like no other. The simple reality is that God has chosen to work through people, disciples, you and me. The truth is the disciples of the first century are granted remarkable powers to heal and to exercise demons, to cleanse lepers, even to raise the dead. But Jesus also challenges them not to take money or pay or extra clothes or a staff for protection or even sandals. And it probably caused some of them fear to go out into the world like that, seemingly helpless. But Jesus wanted for all to understand that it should be no secret that God's provision, what God will provide, is sufficient. It's sufficient. That, you see, is the truth. Hence, hence, there is no reason to fear. They are to undertake their mission in complete vulnerability and dependence on God. That is what a disciple is to do. They are to be clear that they go as sheep in the midst of wolves. They will face arrests and beatings, opposition even from family members, our passage tells us. Hatred and persecution. It is hard to stand up sometimes, but standing up is something the people of God are called to do. And I think standing up for others makes God smile. It reminds the father of his one and only son. Don't let fear coax you into keeping secrets. You are not called the keepers of secrets. You are called to be the speaker and the liver of truth. Our country will not get better from racial tensions by pushing difficult truths under the rug or by just going along or by putting fingers in your ears because we don't really want to hear or to be impacted or to invest ourselves. Any speaker of the truth has to first be and always remain a listener. If you want to be a speaker of the truth, you must first be a listener, a listener of God and a listener of God in others. Don't let fear entice you to perpetuate secrets. Don't be frozen in fear because the truth is what is needed by every one of us. Amen. Amen.
friends, I spoke of the need to be corporately, in, in addition to being individually truth tellers, that corporately we need that challenge as well. You may think, you know, the story in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was you know, way back in 1921. It's a group of people that have nothing to do with uh, me or you here. Um, but it speaks to something underneath the surface that's systemic, that needs to be addressed uh, to further push that point. After 35 blocks of homes and buildings were incinerated, and these black owners of homes and businesses filed their insurance papers, not one insurance claim was honored because the system said we're just pushing this away. It didn't really happen. Friends, we are called to be truth tellers. We are called to be truth listeners. Go from this place and know that the God of truth is with you this week. Amen. Amen.